Welcome back guys, this is a continuation of our ACLS series. This time we are treating a patient that is complaining of chest pain, so let's jump right in. So we will ask the patient the following, what happened that brought you into the hospital? When did the symptoms start? What were you doing when the symptoms started? Do you have any difficulty breathing? What other symptoms do you have? I don't have any other symptoms. Ouch. Are you allergic? Are you allergic to anything? No, I'm not allergic to anything. Do you take any medication? Do you take any medication? No, don't take any medication. Do you have any, do you have any problems? medical problems? I have some angina when I exercise. Do you have, do you have any pain? Yes, I have pain in my chest. On a scale of zero On a scale of zero to ten, how bad is the pain? Now we're going to get basic vital signs consisting of a pulse oximeter, a three-laid ECG with paddles, a blood pressure, and a temperature. We will also start an IV. The IV is inserted. Draw labs, specifically a troponin level, and get a 12-lead EKG. So let's review what we have found thus far. According to the patient, he suddenly felt chest discomfort 45 minutes ago while mowing the lawn. His chest pain is normal for when he exercises or does some sort of strenuous activity. He does have some difficulty breathing, he isn't allergic to anything, and doesn't take any medication. He rated his chest pain at an 8 out of 10. On this 12 lead we just did, we have ST elevation, uh, myocardial infarction or STEMI and leads V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Leads V1 through V4 are usually for the interior portion of the heart and leads V5 and V6 are the lateral side of the heart. According to the American Heart Association on page 69 of the ACLS Provider Handbook, STEMI is defined as an ST segment elevation in two or more continuous leads or a new onset of a left bundle branch block. In this case, we can definitely say that this patient is suffering from a STEMI with supporting evidence clinically. Now that we have completed a focus assessment, we will treat this patient with nitroglycerin 0.4 mg sublingually. This is safe in this case because our blood pressure is not low or we do not have hypotension given our current vitals as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. As the nitroglycerin is working, we will continue to do a more general assessment from head to toe and auscultate the heart, lungs, and there abdomen. There is no obvious airway obstruction. He is breathing His skin is cool 21. and he is very sweaty. Breaths per minute. The chest is moving normally. There is nothing to find on examination of the abdomen and pelvis. There is nothing to find on examination of the legs. There is nothing to find on examination of the arms. There is nothing to find on examination of the back and spine. The breath sounds are normal. The heart sounds are normal. Primary treatment drugs include oxygen, nitroglycerin, sublingually, aspirin, morphine, and potentially fibrinolytic therapy. However, adjunctive therapy or treatment like heparin and beta blockers can be found on page 71 of the ACLS Provider Handbook. On page 72 of the ACLS Provider Handbook, you can also find a warning about inappropriate monitoring of the patient that is on a heparin drip which can lead to issues with bleeding that could be just as life-threatening. Be sure to follow your hospital's policy in this regard and adhere to it. We will now give 325 milligrams of aspirin, IV heparin, and metoferol tartate 5 milligrams IV push, and start a 1 liter bolus with a slow rate to follow of 75 milliliters per hour as we prepare for a pericutaneous coronary intervention or PCI.
In the treatment of STEMI, or ST elevation myocardial infraction, PCI has a mandate for door to balloon time of 90 minutes. This means from when the patient arrives to the emergency room doors or complains of chest pain in a clinical setting to the cardiologist inflating the balloon in the affected coronary artery, that time that has elapsed is less than 90 minutes. Another option is Fibrolinux, which is the same parameters, but instead of 90 minutes, you only have 30 minutes, and since the patient arrived 45 minutes after the initial onset of symptoms, we could not use fibrolinic therapy, and we would have to use PCI. This info can be found on page 70 of the ACLS Provider Handbook. Generally, the PCI procedure will involve placing a stent in the infected area and allows for a long-term solution as opposed to a fibrolinic therapy intervention, and PCI is generally preferred over fibrolinic therapy. Approximately 33% of delays for missing the 90-minute window occur to evaluation in the emergency room or emergency department being prolonged. It is important to know your facility's protocols on this matter and act accordingly to save lives. We're just going to do a quick little review here and make sure that we've double-checked everything that we've already done and evaluated all the interventions that we have performed in order to make sure we haven't missed anything. As you guys can see, we did very well in this scenario for our first try, and we were not given any alerts to indicate we had performed incorrect or inappropriate treatment. I hope that you like this video, and it will help you in your practice or perhaps your personal understanding. Please provide feedback in the form of comments, likes, or by subscribing in order for all of us to determine how to improve clinically and perhaps provide more content you would like to see regarding nursing. Till next time, stay safe.